Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring John Garfield and Jane Wyman in Body and Soul with Marie Windsor. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeling. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Actors, like any craftsman, must serve a long, hard apprenticeship. And when they learn their trade this hard way, we get the finished artistry of stars like John Garfield and Jane Wyman. Add talent such as theirs to the exciting story of body and soul, and the result is drama that hits as hard as our pugilistic hero. John Garfield was a natural to star in this enterprise picture, and we're particularly proud tonight to bring you Jane Wyman as the other half of our starring team, because Jane's latest performance on the screen is the finest she's ever given. Before we began rehearsals for the play, I took a few days vacation in Palm Springs. While I was there, I attended a wedding. The bride was one of the loveliest I've ever seen, with a complexion as radiant as the desert sun. It proved one thing about Lux Soap I've suspected right along. All the beautiful Lux girls are not in Hollywood. Here's the curtain for Body and Soul, starring Jane Wyman as Peg and John Garfield as Charlie, with Marie Windsor as Alice. New York City, Greenwich Village, the annual election rally and entertainment of the Iroquois Democratic Club. As always, part of the entertainment consists of some amateur prize fighting. Knockout on one minute and eight seconds of the first round, our own neighborhood champ, Charlie Davis! Yeah! Yes, this is a big night for Charlie Davis, winning his fight and awarded the privilege of dancing with Miss Iroquois Democratic Club. A couple of hours later, Charlie's escorted Miss Iroquois Democratic Club to her home. Thanks for bringing me home, champ. Good night. Ah, oh, come on. Open the door. It's early. Then why don't you go to the movies? Besides, you said your friends were waiting for you in the pool hall. Oh, sure, you don't mind waiting. Look, just five minutes. Mm, all right. Five minutes. Say, um, what's your name? Peg. Peg, huh? Hey, look at all the paintings. What do you do here? I live here. I paint. And I go to art school. Well, I, I don't get it. Uh, what about this Miss Iroquois Democratic Club? I, I figured you were a dancer on the stage or something. Well, there's a talent agency that arranges these extra little jobs for me. I get $25, and the crowd gets a whistle. <laughs> a painter, huh? Um, how about doing me? Well, sure. Settle for a pencil sketch? Sure. All right, sit down then. Let me get my pad. Uh, how's this for a pose, see? Uh, like I was going to throw a jab and cross with my right. Oh, that's just lovely. Now, try not to move too much. Are you going to be a professional prize fighter, or are you going to run for president? Oh, I, I just want to be a success. You mean you want other people to think you're a success? Well, sure. It's every man for himself. Hey, let me see how you're doing. Ouch. Well, keep your hands where they belong. Okay. You sore, huh? No, I'm not sore. Aren't you going to finish the drawing? I think you'd better go home. Oh, I'll behave, Peg. Honest. Besides, I wouldn't go home. I'd go to the pool hall, and that's bad influence on me. But your friends will be there. And you can brag how you knocked that fellow out in the first round tonight. What's so wrong with that? Nothing, if that's what you want. Well, my mother thinks I'm a bum. Maybe she's right. What does your father say? He's dead. Died about a month ago. Oh, I'm sorry. We got a candy store, see? Only we won't have it for long. The store's finished. Debts, you know, when my old man died. I'm trying to get a decent job, but I guess there aren't any around. Not for me. Hey, uh, can I uh, see you again sometime? What for? Well, um, well, just to see you, anything. Try sometime. You mean that? Try. Well, I don't get it, Peg. Why should you want to see me? Why should you want to see me? Well, because... Because you're beautiful and... You're level and... You're different. 
You're sort of innocent, aren't you? You know, I learned a poem in school once. You remind me of it. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? What symmetry? Well built. Oh. Good night, Charlie. Huh? Oh, okay. Uh, good night, Peg. <laughs> Oh, well, the guy was wide open. He was begging for it, okay? So I let him have it. Hey, feed it to guys. Go on, floor. What's the matter with Shorty? Uh, shake him, will you, Charlie? I gotta talk to you. My trainer, he's gotta talk to me. <laughs> hey, Charlie. Charlie, just see who walked in here? Mr. Quinn. Quinn, huh? Charlie, don't say it like that. He's a big manager. He was there tonight, I saw him. You mean when I knocked that guy out? Right at ringside. Come on, we're gonna talk to him. But he's playing pool. Charlie, you want to get somewhere, don't you? Sure I do, but... You... All right, just leave it to me. We're going to talk to Mr. Quinn. You got something to say, Shorty? Then say it. Uh, I just wanted you to meet my friend, Mr. Quinn. Uh, this is Charlie Davis. Yeah? How are you? Uh, like the fights tonight, Mr. Quinn? How'd you like that quick knockout Charlie made? I've seen knockouts before. Charlie's a great fighter. He's got style, Mr. Quinn. A little training in So me. what? So what? You won the amateurs. Listen to me, Shorty. Kids win this and that every day, a thousand of them. Every city in the country. And one out of a hundred, maybe, turns professional. One out of a thousand is worth watching, and about one out of a million is worth coffee and donuts. Now tell your boy here to go get himself an honest job. Okay, Blackie, rack him. Wait a minute. Look, kid, I'm playing pool, so you don't bother me. Nobody's asking you for coffee and donuts. I want you to get that straight. You see, Mr. Quinn, a natural fighter. You got a champion here. Shut up. I'm asking nobody for favor, see? Quinn or nobody? I'll see you tomorrow. It's me, Mom. Oh, a champion. I already had a delegation from the pool room. They congratulated your mother. Well, uh, it's, it's better to win than to lose. Surely. And the other boy... You hurt him good, champion? Well, it's only a prize fight, Mom. It's a sport. So, now you'll be a professional sport and make a living hitting people, knocking their teeth out, smashing their noses. Is that what you want, sportsman? Mom, please, give me a rest. I looked for a job. For three weeks solid, I looked for a job. What do you want? You want me to do like Pop did, be like Pop was, spend my life selling two-cent sodas to kids? Mr. Davis, give me a penny candy. Mr. Davis, give me a pack of cigarettes. Mind the baby. Make mine raspberry. Not me, Mom. Understand? Not me. Your father wanted you to fool around pool rooms, hang around street corners. He wanted you to study to be something. I want to be a fighter. So fight for something, but not for money. Okay, Mom. I'll, I'll try again. Oh, Charlie. Charlie, you're not a bad boy. It's not for me. It's for you, Charlie. Your future. Sure, Mom, sure. Hey, Charlie, I spoke to him again, Mr. Quinn. He'll take you on. Uh, oh, hello, Mrs. Davis. Well, tell Quinn I'm not interested. Charlie, you nuts. I'm through fighting. Ain't that plain enough? But, Charlie, Mr. Quinn says... Tell him, Charlie. Tell him. You heard me, Shorty. I'm through. Hi, Charlie. What you doing here? She had some pool? I came in to get warm. You could freeze to death on the street. I thought Peg was coming down. Told me yesterday Peg was coming down to meet your mom. She hasn't shown up yet. <laughs> Maybe she won't come. She'll come. That's what I'm afraid of. Afraid of. That she will come. It's going to be great. Peg and my mother. Well, if you're going with a girl... Who's I... going with a girl? You need dough to go to with a girl. No job, huh? What do you think? Look, you didn't forget about dinner. You promised when Peg came to the house Who's that you... Who's forgotten? Hey, see the paper this morning, Charlie? Huh? Yeah, look. No unemployment for him. Mike Marino KOs Phillips in the second round. <laughs> You'll keep the paper, Charlie. Look to the one ads. Maybe somebody died and you can carry the corpse. All right, all right. Let me alone. I saw Phillips this morning. That fight last night was framed. Phillips took a dive, but he got 50 bucks. 50 bucks for taking a dive. Phillips is smart, Charlie. You don't have to take his girl walking in the street. That needle's getting kind of dull, shorty. Okay, Charlie, throw your talent in the gutter. Hey, ain't that your girl coming down the street? Huh? Oh, yeah. Come on, let's go. Hey, Peg, Peg. Hello, Tiger. You, 
Well, you remember Shorty, Peg? Huh? Oh, the ex-champ's ex-trainer. Of course I do. Hiya, Peg. Well, um, uh, let's take a walk around the block. Walk? Isn't this where you live? Yeah, but, uh, well, uh, my mother, Peg, uh, I thought I'd better warn you. Well, she talks like I was bringing you home on approval or something. I didn't want you to get embarrassed or sore with me. I won't get sore with you. No use, Charlie. You can't call it off now. Just tell Peg you'll like long engagements. Is this a proposal, Charlie? Oh, Peg, listen. It's a proposal from Mama. And I'll tell you just how she'll start off. First, she'll say, and where do you come from, Miss Boone? And where do you come from, Miss Bourne? Ah, what did I tell you? <laughs> and what's so funny? <laughs> but Peg told you, Mom, she comes from Highland Town. Thank you. Yes, she did say. My father was a druggist there. A professional man. Very nice. Charlie's father's brother was a teacher, and Charlie's going to night school. He starts next week. He told you. Yes. Oh, I think it's a wonderful idea. Your father's a druggist, a professional man. You're an artist. You know, Shorty a... lives on the same block, Peg. Got ten brothers and sisters. And seven of them out of work. The times are hard. It's not easy for a boy to get started nowadays. But if his friends encourage him, if he goes to school and gets an education, if he makes sacrifices and tries ah, to... I end up wearing glasses and still broke. <laughs> you got something there, pal. Glasses and still broke. <laughs> so, Mom. I have ears, Charlie. Mrs. Davis? Yes? I'm Miss Tedder. Oh. Oh, yes. Come in, please. We'd better go in the living room. Peg, excuse me for a minute, please. I won't be long. Who's the dame, Charlie? I don't know. I never saw her before. I have your application here, Mrs. Davis. Mrs. Anna Davis, widow. Is that correct? Yes. I'm Anna Davis. Now, this is just a form so we can have the proper check. Race, white. Religion, Jewish. Nationality, American. Mom. Oh, uh, this is your son? Uh, I'm Charlie Davis. You're unemployed. Well, you got a job for me? Have you tried? He tried. All the questions on the form must be answered, Mrs. Davis. Now then, have you tried to get a job? Would I be asking for a loan from charity if I could find work? Oh, it isn't personal. We have to ask. Have you any resources, any, uh, well, jewelry? She has a wedding ring. Charlie, please. We don't ask women to sell their wedding rings, Mr. Davis. I wish you'd understand. I have to ask these questions. Charlie, go into the other room. I'm staying right here. Is this furniture yours, Mrs. Davis? Yes, yes, the furniture's hers. Now, get out of here. I won't have you talking like that. Get out of here. Get out! We have to ask questions if we're going to help. We don't want any help. Tell them we're dead. We don't want any help. Very well. I, I'm sorry, Mrs. Davis. Goodbye. Charlie, you fool. Charity, why did you do it? Why? To buy myself fancy clothes. Oh, it was for you to learn, to get an education. To make something of yourself. Shorty. Shorty, come here. Yeah, Charlie? Get your coat. Go out and find Quinn. T find him now. Quinn, you mean? Get me that I, fight I... from Quinn. I want money. Do you understand? I want money. No. No, I forbid it. Better buy a gun and shoot yourself. You forget, Ma. You need money to buy a gun. Charlie. Hey. I... I thought you left. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry you had to stand there and hear it. I looked for you on the street, even the pool hall. Then your mother said maybe you'd be here up on the roof. Peg, can you understand? Can you understand? I don't want any handout. You think I like the idea of waiting around for the whole world to make up its mind what to do with me? What is it you want to do? Anything you want to do is all right with me. I must be in love with you, Charlie. I don't know what else it could be. It'll be quick, Peg. Quick. I got fists, see? I got two good fists. Tiger, tiger. Yeah, that's right. I got claws. But not for you, Peg. Not for you. In a few moments, we'll bring you Act Two of Body and Soul. Now, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter. What's on your calendar this week, Libby? A new film, Mr. Keeley, with the interesting title, No Minor Vices. And the distinction of being the first picture to be made by Enterprise Studios for release through Metro-Golden-Mare. Uh-huh. And there's another unusual thing about it, too. Each of the three stars plays a comedy role for the first time. 
Dana Andrews faces some amusing situations as a children's doctor. <laughs> well, that role should come naturally to him with four youngsters of his own. <laughs> then there's Lily Palmer, who plays Dana's wife and head nurse, and Louis Jourdain as a temperamental young artist. An ideal setup for an entertaining picture. The plot of No Minor Vices really thickens when Dana Andrews starts to make love to Jane Wyatt who plays his assistant nurse. Well, I can't imagine anyone who'd look more appealing in a nurse's uniform than Jane Wyatt. Well, it's very becoming. Jane has a fresh, natural look that's irresistible. John Kennedy here would say her luxe complexion has a lot to do with it. It certainly shows to advantage, Libby, under that crisp nurse's cap. Yes, Jane Wyatt never worries about keeping her skin fresh as a flower. She told me she owes a vote of thanks to her daily complexion care. Lux soap facials give her skin just the gentle, protecting care it needs, she said. Those facials are a real beauty care, as nine out of ten famous stars have discovered. Recent tests by skin specialists prove that. In three out of four cases, skin became softer and smoother in a short time. An excellent reason for every woman who wants lovelier skin to try this fragrant white soap. Screen stars tell you it gives skin fresh new beauty. Why not get a supply of Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow? It's Hollywood's own complexion care, you know. We return you now to William Keeley. Act Two of Body and Soul, starring Jane Wyman as Peg and John Garfield as Charlie, with Marie Windsor as Alice. <laughs> Once in a great while in the profession of prize fighting, a natural like Charlie Davis will catapult to the top almost overnight. Charlie has all the heart and skill to become a champion. But more than that, his lethal fury in the ring is driven by a dread of the poverty he's known all his life. Charlie must have money. And if the champion makes the most, then Charlie's going to be champion. Under Quinn's management, he spent the year away from New York. 21 fights, 19 knockouts, two decisions. But now, Charlie's back home again. Hey, this is some apartment house, Shorty. You sure this is where I live? Yeah, we'll soon find out. These are the keys Quinn sent me. Charlie. Hey. Oh, Peg. You're back. You're home. Oh, darling, I wanted so to meet you at the airport, Don't but... talk, Peg. You're wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, she's wonderful. Hey, Charlie, ain't you going to look the place over? He is a some layout. Later, later, later. Hey, isn't Quinn here? Oh, he said he'd drop by later. He's seeing somebody named Roberts. Roberts? Already? Hey, that's great. Yeah, great. Uh, Peg, if you and Charlie want to be alone... Oh, honey... stick around. Uh, Peg, your, your new job. In your letter, you said that... Oh, I'm a big success. Third assistant art director now. Swell. You miss me? It's been a long year, Charlie. Hey, <laughs> take it easy. What's the matter? Oh, my hand. That guy in Detroit had a head like a rock. Oh, Charlie. And this, this scar on your chin? Chicago. And this? Philadelphia. And there? Boston. Oh, you get something every time, baby. But it's worth it as long as you win. Lots of money, Peg. Lots of clothes. Lots of headlines. Tell her, Shorty. I'll be right back. Got to change my shirt. You look tired out, Shorty. I just worried, Peg. Worried? Over him? Yeah. He's all on edge, Peg. He's all wound up like a guy in a jag. Peg, you, you gotta... Oh, what is it? Shorty, say it. You two still gonna get married? Well, I haven't had time to say no. Then get married right away. Why? Have I got a rival, Shorty? Yeah, money. They're turning him into a money machine, Peg. A gold mine, an oil well. They're cutting him up a million ways. You're the only one left, Peg. He won't listen to me. If you don't hold on to him, it's... Goodbye, Charlie Davis. Marry him, Peg, but do it now. Now. Hey, Peg, how do you like this coat? Camel's hair, handmade. Come on, honey, let's get out of here. We're going to paint up the time. We're gonna... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Mom, I forgot about Mom. Well, she should be here in a little while, Charlie. Why don't we wait? No, no, I've already waited a year. Shorty, when the old lady gets here, make her happy. Huh? Make with the jokes. Quinn will be looking for you, Charlie. If he got to see Roberts... See... Who's Roberts? The guy you got to see if you want to crack at the championship. Eh, hey, he's more than that, Peg. In this racket, he's the dough, the real estate, everything. Well, what does he want from Charlie? Everything. I told you a hundred times, after I fight Ben Chaplin, I'll be champ, and I'll give the orders. I'll say what and when. Sure you will, to everybody except Roberts. There'll be more dough, won't there? So let him cut it up, a bigger pie, more slices, more to eat for everybody. It doesn't make sense. Nothing makes sense, only dough. Come on, baby, let's start spending some. <laughs> 
I'm sorry we kept you waiting, Ma. Honest. But Peg and I, we, we've been doing the town. Oh, let me just look at you, Charlie. Let me see. Well, no change, Mom. You neither. How do you like everything, huh? Oh, it's wonderful. Sorry we kept you late. Oh, it's my fault we're so late, Miss Davis. It's my fault, everybody. We danced and danced, and Charlie just couldn't get me home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at my new coat. Look, it's a wedding present. We're going to get married right away. <laughs> we just decided. Charlie, Peg. Oh, it's been such a day. Every place we went, there were millions of people and all intimate, personal friends of Charlie's. And Charlie was king and I was Charlie's girlfriend. <laughs> I'm tight. <laughs> I bet I'm tight. I know you, Mrs. Davis. You're his mother. And you're Mr. Quinn, his manager. And you're Shorty, his friend. <laughs> and you're... Who are you? I'm nobody yet. Oh, well, don't suck. We're all nobody. You know what nobody is? Nobody's anybody who belongs to somebody. So if you belong to nobody, you're somebody. Understand? <laughs> <laughs> Some wife I'm getting, Mom. She likes champagne. You won't have to worry about Pig. Oh, uh, Charlie, uh, this is Alice, a friend of mine. She sings in a nightclub. Glad to meet you, Charlie. And uh, this is Miss Bourne. Hi. Could I try it on, your new coat? It's all yours. Well, Charlie, <laughs> when's the wedding? Right away, Shorty. Good, good. We'll invite the whole neighborhood, huh? Oh, gee, what a coat. Soft, like a baby's skin. I bet it cost a lot of money. <laughs> it's too rich for your blood, honey. Hey, is that the door? Uh, I'll get it, Shorty. Hello, Mr. Roberts. We've been waiting for you. Beat it. You're Charlie Davis, huh? Pleased to meet you, Mr. Roberts. Uh, this is my mother. Ah, good evening, Mrs. Davis. And this is my girl. We're going to get married. Oh, congratulations. And this is our friend Shorty. He's our trainer. How about a drink, Mr. Roberts? Never touch it. What's on your mind, Mr. Roberts? No, social call. Social call? What kind of a deal did you cook up with Quinn this afternoon? Hey, take it easy, Shorty. Didn't you tell him, Quinn? Well, I, I figured to wait till uh, we all got together. Who did you say this fella is? Shorty? He's my friend, my trainer. Your friend? For how much? As long as we're talking business, Charlie, I'd rather talk it alone. Well, uh, yeah, sure. Come on in here. You want to fight the champ, we got to get a few things straightened out. Whatever you and Quinn decide. Sure, only I don't talk money with Quinn. Close the door. I only make one kind of a deal, Charlie. 50%. 50% of what? Quinn gets 30%, Shorty gets 10%, I get 60%. Well, then we start fresh. You're a fresh young kid, so we start fresh. But what about Quinn? Well, he's your manager. We both need him. You give him 5%, I give him 5 And Shorty? Well, I don't ask you what you give your mother, Charlie, or your girl... I pay my expenses, you pay yours. Well, Shorty gets 10%. Do it my way. You fight for the championship right away. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll take care of Shorty myself, but uh, don't say anything about it. What about me, Mr. Roberts? What percent am I worth? Peg, did you hear? I get a crack at the championship right away. What about it, Mr. Roberts? After all, I made him what he is because I told him to fight. He's going to make a lot of money. Enough for everybody. Uh, just take a tip, kid. Yeah, Postpone the wedding bells. Keep your mind on that championship. Well, good night, Charlie's girl. It's a very nice coat. Did I mention it was a wedding present? Well, just remember, after mink comes sable. Line up a training camp, Quinn. The deal's all set. Good night, everybody. When do you want to start, Charlie? When? Right away. Then you're not going to get married? Well, sure, we're going to get married, but it'll wait. Why can't the fight wait? Ma, you can't do a thing like that. Oh, Charlie's right, Mrs. Davis. You can't postpone a big fight like this. That's my baby. You know what else, Ma? I want you to give up the candy store. I want you to live here in a decent place. I live in a decent place, Charlie. Yeah, and it's paid for. And not by Roberts. What are you beefing about? What's the difference? It's money, ain't it? You get it, Peg, don't you? Yeah, I get it, Charlie. What else can you do? Yeah, sure. Oh, take it easy. Slow down. <laughs> Who wants to slow down? If you ask me how he looks, I'd say like a million bucks. Count him. You got some nerve, Alice, barging in on me here. I came to see Charlie. Well, you saw him now. Turn around and go back to New York. No hurry. The nightclub doesn't open for a week. I thought you'd learn to behave yourself. I think I'm behaving just fine. 
So does Charlie. Just one word of advice, honey. In two weeks, he fights the champ. Until that's over, I got troubles enough. What trouble? He's gonna win, isn't he? Suppose we just wait and see what happens, huh? Sure, Eddie. Let's wait and see what happens. Chaplain Davis Bout, sell out. Great Negro fighter will risk title before capacity crowd. Davis, 2-1 to one underdog and bid for crown. Sensational newcomer meets Ben Chaplin tonight. Claims he'll knock out champ before sixth round. How do you feel, Ben? I'm okay, Mr. Robert. Yeah, it looks fine, Arnold. You're a good manager. You haven't forgotten the deal we made. The 40,000 bucks you owe me? No, I haven't forgotten. I'm talking about the fight. A decision, right? No slugging. That's the way it still stands, Mr. Roberts. Why, well, sure. We made a deal. And Quinn understands and Charlie Davis? I don't mind saying I'm scared. Scared? You'll make a pile of dough. I'm talking about Ben here. I told you two months ago he's got a blood clot. Those specialists said he shouldn't fight anymore. And I told you two months ago a champ's got to fight. Isn't that right, Ben? People don't count with you, Mr. Roberts. Just money. But don't worry now, Mr. Arnold. As long as Davis don't get rough, we'll make it look real good. Well, Roberts wouldn't cross us up, Ben. Not like that. Get ready, champ. You got about five minutes. And once again, as the third round ends, the champion, Ben Chaplin, is on the canvas. We cannot understand Chaplin's style tonight, ladies and gentlemen. From the start, he's tried to box with Davis, apparently trying to outsmart this hard, this vicious, punching wildcat who must sense that the championship is all but in his grasp right now. In his corner, Chaplin seems completely dazed, whether from that last blow of Davis's or simply from surprise, we cannot say. But we do know that nobody can go on absorbing the terrible punishment that Davis has been handing out since the very first round. There goes the 10-second warning. Chaplin's manager still working on the champion, talking to him, pleading with him. Chaplin's on his feet now, and out rushes Davis as the bell sounds for round four. The boys are in the center of the ring. Chaplin leads with the left, a jab, another jab. Chaplin seems a little more confident now. He's just dodged a terrific left hook thrown by Davis and counters with a stiff right hand to the body as Davis seems to... There it is, ladies and gentlemen. Chaplin's down as Davis throws a tremendous right hand to his head. The count's at four, but the fight's over. And there's a new world's middleweight champion, Charlie Davis. Can I come in, Mr. Arnold? It's me, Davis. Come in, Charlie. How is he? How's Ben? He's still unconscious. Well, Doc, what do we do? We better get him right to the hospital. You must have hit him awfully hard, Davis. Anything I can do, anything. I mean, money, He'll anything. He'll be all right, Charlie. Will he, Mr. Roberts? No, I don't think so. Shorty, get Charlie out of here. You better go, Charlie. I'll stay. I'll go down to the hospital with Arnold. If Peg wasn't waiting for I'll me... I'll see you both later at the nightclub. Mr. Arnold, please, if I can do anything... Charlie, I... please, beat it. Yeah. You promised Davis would take it easy, didn't you, Mr. Roberts? Look at Ben. He's going to die. You better go, too, Shorty. Wait a minute. Who promised to take care of what? He knew Ben had a blood clot on the brain. He promised me. I guess I've been a little slow, ain't I? I don't like being your partner, Mr. Roberts. I'm out of it as of right now. And I think Charlie will be out of it, too. You've always been out of it, Shorty. Whatever you get, you get from Charlie. He's giving you a handout, didn't he tell you? No. Then why don't you ask him? Let me know what happens, Arnold. Send me the hospital bill. Hey, champ, what do you say? One more picture, you and Miss Bourne. Hey, fellas, give me a break. I just want to celebrate. Okay, champ, we'll catch you later. Charlie, isn't that Shorty? There at the bar? Huh? Where? Well, stay here. I'll get him. Oh, hello, Peg. Aren't you joining us, Shorty? No. Why not? What's the matter? How's Ben? They won't know for a while yet. You didn't win that title tonight, Charlie. Ben was double-crossed. They promised him an easy go. Where do you get that stuff? Who promised? Ben was sick. He had a blood clot. They all knew. A blood clot? Ah, uh, here's Roberts. Well, ask him. The old alibi, champ. You'll get used to it. You don't think I beat him square, is that it, Shorty? You beat him foul. I don't like partners like Roberts, Charlie. It's rotten. Tell him he's out. What are you talking about? Are you crazy? Roberts says I'm out. Am I, Charlie? 
You're going to keep on giving me the 10% for old time's sake? What's the difference? We won, didn't we? That's what we wanted. We didn't win. Roberts won. Charlie went faster with rats. If you don't like the racket, Shorty, you can always quit. I quit two hours ago in Ben's dressing room. Peg, if he has any sense left, he'll do the same. I'm through, Charlie. Shorty! Shorty, wait! Peg, I'm... I'm sorry, I... I had to say what I did. Oh, don't run out on me, Shorty. Please don't leave me alone. I can't do it all by myself. Looks like you'll have to, Peg. Shorty, wait, please. Good luck, Peg. Shorty, look out! <laughs> Sit down, Charlie. Let's sit here on the bench. We've walked all the way to the river. Let me find a cab. I'll take you home. In a minute, in a minute. How can so much happen in just one night? The fight. Ben. Shorty killed by a truck. I say the words, but I can't believe them. It's like Shorty was blind. Like he walked right into that truck. Is Ben going to die too, Charlie? No, no. No, he isn't going to die. They say he'll live. They say he'll be all right. If one could only say that it all started here or, or there. If what started? This, this thing you're in, Charlie. And you've got to get out of it. Well, what can I do? It was an accident. Only the dying. Nothing else. We can't live with these people, Charlie. I couldn't bear it. Well, you don't have to see them or meet them again. We'll live fine. I'll make the money. I'll look after Ben. Believe me, I'll do everything I can. But I can't start again. From what? With what? But, darling, you won't be starting again with nothing. But if you don't get out, someday it'll be worse. You'll be like Ben. Uh, I'm too smart for that. It's nothing to argue, Charlie. I can't live this way. You stop now, or I stop. Peg. Peg, that's not fair. Was it fair for Shorty to die? It was an accident. And for Ben to fight with a blood clot? I didn't know. One way or the other, Charlie. But... but I'm the champ. You mean Roberts is the champ. I can't marry you, Charlie. It would mean marrying him. I, I can't, Charlie. Just... I can't. I, I can't. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. We'll bring you the third act of Body and Soul in a few moments. Tonight, we welcome a charming newcomer to the screen, Miss Laura Elliott. She's something of a record breaker, too. I understand that though you have been on the took your screen test only last summer, Laura, you've already had several important roles. Well, I was pretty lucky to get started so soon, Mr. Keeley. Why, it's exciting to be at a big studio like Paramount. I spend hours on the sound stages. I know of no better way to learn the technique of movie making. Oh, and especially when there's a big production going on. Like Sealed Verdict. Oh, yes. That's Ray Milan's new picture about GI fraternization in Berlin. By the way, doesn't Sealed Verdict expose the true story of those beautiful German girls who worked as underground agents? Yes, it does. They call them sweetheart saboteurs. Florence Marley, who co-stars with Ray, is one of them. I was especially interested in watching her on the set. You know, it's her first American film. Yes, I know. The studio brought her from Europe, where she'd already established an enviable record as an actress. And she's very beautiful, too. Flaming red hair and a lovely complexion to go with it. By the way, Mr. Kennedy, she's just delighted with Lux Toilet Soap. Says it's wonderful to get all she wants here in America. I'll bet she likes that big, generous-sized new bath cake. Oh, everybody does. It's made to order for luxurious bathing. Thanks, Miss Laura Elliott. You've explained why Hollywood is so keen about the new bath size Lux Toilet Soap. There's real luxury in the abundant, creamy lather, in the delicate fragrance fastidious women love. 
If you haven't used this satin-smooth new bath cake, why not try it tomorrow? Get a supply for the men in the family. This big new bath size makes a hit with them, too. Here's our producer, Mr. William Keeley. The curtain rises on the third act of Body and Soul, starring John Garfield as Charlie and Jane Wyman as Peg, with Marie Windsor as Alice. It's more than three years since Charlie Davis won the championship and lost Peg. Three crazy, exciting years, full of headlines and highballs and glory and thousand-dollar bills and a girl named Alice to help Charlie spend them. Five times, Charlie's defended his title and won. And now, after months of idleness, Charlie's going to fight again. Hello, Robbie. I was in the neighborhood. Thought I'd drop in. Didn't know you were here, Quinn. Ah, just talking things over, champ. Glad you stopped by, Charlie. (laughs) Oh, you won't be. I'm short on dough. I, I came to make a touch. Nothing doing. Why not? You'll get it all back after the Marlowe fight. By the way, Quinn just told me you got a new trainer. Yeah, Ben Chaplin. He's okay now, huh? You know you can write that kind of charity off your income tax. Ben called it charity, too, at first, till I told him I needed someone like him, someone I could trust. (laughs) Charlie, that ain't like you. About the Marlowe fight, Charlie. The odds are three to one you'll win. That's a lot of dough, if you bet on Marlowe. I'm not handing my title over to Marlowe. I can beat him. You gonna bet on yourself? Sure I am. Get smart, Charlie. Right now, is the dough rolling in or is it rolling out? Oh, you're dreaming. Maybe Mr. Robert's got something there, You'd champ. You'd like to see me take a dive, wouldn't you, Quinn? Me? Why should I? Your money in a bank. But facts are facts. You said you needed some dough, Charlie. I got 60 grand here for you. For a clean, fair fight that Marlowe wins. 15 rounds to a decision. 60 grand at 3 to 1, plus your end of the purse. Also at 3 to 1. No, no. I don't think I like it. Let's stop being nice to each other. You're into me for a lot of money. I've already made my arrangements with Marlowe, and nobody backs out now. That's the way it is. Besides, a lot of guys think Marlowe can beat you on the square. I don't take a dive for nobody. What do you think I am, a tanker? Who's asking you to take a dive? I said decision. Fifteen rounds to a decision. You still throwing that party tonight? Why not? Now I got something to celebrate. Where's the champ, Alice? Dreamland, sweetie. Passed out. Oh, boy, did he hang one on. You gonna bet on the fight? Every cent I can beg, borrow, and steal. I just remember I told you about it. Charlie's gonna make a snoot full of dough. <laughs> he go through it in a year with your help. That gives me a year, Eddie. What about you? I'll find myself another mug. They come and they go, but I stay. That's the reason you should listen to me. Don't you ever get tired. I got no time for pride. Just don't be too sure about Charlie. Every time he's low down, he's gone to Peg. He's not going to feel so hot after this fight. I don't care where his heart is. Only the money. What about me, how I feel? Oh, don't romance me, Eddie. You're getting old. You could use a new paint job yourself. And I know where to get it. Just watch me, Eddie. Yes? Milkman. Here. Early delivery, Peg. Charlie. Well, uh, uh, come in. You have to excuse the way I look. I I don't often have company at 5.30 in the morning. Trouble, Charlie? No. (laughs) No no trouble. Well, come on. I'll make some coffee. You look as if you need some. Yeah, I I got up a little early. That is, I... Been celebrating the Marlowe match? I tried to... I thought you skipped all the places in the newspaper that mentioned my name. On the contrary, I read about you religiously. Tomato juice? Thanks. How's the job, Peg? Oh, I've been promoted. I'm a full-fledged designer now. Gee, that's great. What is it this time, Charlie? The last time you came, it was because you were bored. Before that, you were lonely. Once it was your birthday, and once it was mine... What's the occasion now? Does it have to be an occasion? Well, I don't understand. Oh, well, I I worked late last night, and I'm not too bright this morning, but I'll try. Now, what is it you want? Advice? 
comfort or recrimination. I want you, Peg. Here I am, Charlie. Peg, I, I'm scared. I, so low down. I, I wondered, but I had to see and find out once and for all about you, about us. I had to know. But we won't be broke. It's my last fight. Look, I got 60 grand here and more to no, come. No, I... don't, don't say it. Don't tell me what you'll get me. Don't tell me what you can buy. You've got nothing to buy. I, I said all that once before, didn't I? Don't talk, Charlie. You'll only start saying things you've learned to say, not what you once were and what you are. Hey, Peg, you're crying. Well, then don't look at me. Drink your tomato juice. Oh, Charlie. Charlie, the way things happen... It's not fair, is it? Peg, I... Sometimes you wait very long for happiness. Sometimes you fall over it before you learn to walk. I'm all jumpy and silly and shaky. I can't think why. I must be ill. I'm running a high fever. What am I talking about? Do you know? Peg. Do you know what it is to love and be alone? I love you, Charlie. I love you. Darling, I talked you to sleep. Meet me at your mother's. P.S. I took your $60,000 with me. And did she tell you, Ma? Did, did, did Peg tell you? It's my last fight. I'm leaving town Sunday. Training camp. Yes, Peg told me, Charlie. And she said the most beautiful thing I've heard in my lifetime... She said at her age, she didn't think she could ever fall in love again. With who? With us, Dopey. Oh, thanks, Ma. She talks too much, this girl. And not only that, she steals my money. Come on, come on, give. What'd you do with it? <laughs> oh, you're too late. I put it in the bank. Well, in the morning, I'll go down with you and pick it up. What for? Well, I, I need it. Why? Well, to bet on the fight. Oh, but darling, if you lose the money, then you'll want to fight again. Oh, no, no, I'm not going to give it to you. You're rich enough. Well, you don't understand. I, I don't want to quit without money. I don't want to end up broke. But how can you be broke with $60,000? Darling, you can stop right now. Stop now? There's a million bucks riding on my back. If, if I don't bet, I don't get a dime. I'm all mobbed up, tied hand and foot, down to my last buck. Do you think I want to end up like Ben, punchy, with a blood clot on my brain, waiting to die any day, or, or with a bullet in my back in an alley? What do you mean, bullet? Well, don't you understand... The fight's fixed. Fixed? What does it mean, fixed? It's... It, it means I'm throwing the fight, that I'm gonna lose. It's all arranged. That's why I want to bet the 60 grand. You get it, Peg, don't you? Sure, I get it. It's an investment, a sure thing. What? Well, what do you want? What are you looking at? And the people are all so proud of you, Charlie. Like the people in this neighborhood here. You're old friends, Charlie. We have nothing to be proud of. Except maybe you, because you come from them. Then tell them not to bet on me. They know it's a racket. They don't bet to win money, Charlie. It's their way of showing they believe in you. It's none of my business what they do or what they believe in. Nobody looks out for me. Oh, poor Charlie. Nobody looks out for you. Well, you're all so high and mighty. Ma wouldn't have a dime if it wasn't for me. Or a too big candy store or a clothes on her back. Peg, it's my money, isn't it? You were in such a big hurry, you slap it in the back. Sure, you said we're rich enough, like the rest of them. I take the beatings and comes out of my hide and you take the dough like all the rest of them. Well, this time I'm taking care of the dough. Give me back my 60 grand. I didn't put it in the bank. It's there, Charlie, there on the sideboard. Okay, thanks. And take back everything else you've given me. Here, what everybody gives you. The long years of happiness. The broken promises. The lonely nights. Take it all back, Charlie. Take it all back. Hello, Ben. Hello, Mr. Roberts. Where's Charlie? Taking a shower. He's been working out. Ben, how's your head these days? Still on, Mr. Roberts. No thanks to you. You still sore? <laughs> Here, here's something to sweeten the past. I don't take blood money, Mr. Roberts. Mine or anybody else's. Oh, I'll throw it on the ground then. Only now you'll have to bend down to pick it up. Ben, take it easy, Ben. I, I'm okay, Charlie. You shouldn't get excited. Last couple of weeks, I'd been fighting my head all the time. You've got to get your real examination, Ben. Yeah. This money that Roberts gave you. Let me pick it up. Take it, Ben. Money isn't like people. 
It's got no memory. It don't think. Here, put it in your pocket. If you say so, Charlie. Day before the fight. Tomorrow we're back in New York. Always makes me sad, Charlie, seeing him breaking camp, tearing down the sparring ring. But after a fight, I always felt so good. Walked all over Harlem. And the kids, crazy for you and proud. A champion for the whole world to know. This won't be a fight tomorrow night, will it, Charlie? It's all famed and fixed, isn't it? Ben, Ben, look. I've been worried about you, but I got it all arranged. Good doctors, Ben, and a long rest. The guy's got to take care of himself. Yeah. Look, Charlie. You can lick Marlowe. He, he's fast, but he ain't got what it takes. If you keep on top of him, he, he'll go down, I know. You haven't got a thing to worry about, Ben. The bet's in there for you, too. What are you ducking out on, Charlie? You can be on top for years yet. Maybe you let Roberts talk a little too fast. I'd like a word with you, Ben. Say it, Mr. Roberts. Say your word. When do you leave here? Well, when Charlie leaves. I think you'd better go tonight. Lay off him, Roberts. Sure, Charlie. We'll just get somebody else for your corner. Let Charlie take care of that. It's been taken care of. I told Quinn to dump you long ago. He said Charlie wanted you. Well, Charlie doesn't want you anymore. Let Charlie tell me that. Well? Ben, I... I... I'm telling you, so start running. You double-crossed me before. I'm through, washed up. But I don't scare easy anymore. Ben, no, stop. Why, you punchy Ben, your head's soft. Leave him alone, he's sick. I'll let you stay on Charlie's pension list. You don't tell me how to live. No, but I'll tell you how to die. Dan, cut it out. Take it easy. Why, you crazy punch? I don't scare you. I don't scare you. Ben. 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 Hello, Ma. What do you want, Charlie? Ben. Ben's dead. When? A few hours ago. Has anybody called me? No. After Ben died, I... I just got in the car and drove away. I, I had to come down tomorrow anyway, so I thought... I couldn't sleep, Ma. I thought maybe I could... Peg's here, Charlie. She's gone to the market. Oh. I... I couldn't stand up there after they took Ben away. I couldn't sleep, so I, I came down. I had to find a place where I could lie down. You know, Ma, you have to have a place. But those things I, I said to you and Peg, I didn't mean it. You know that. Charlie. What's the matter? Don't you want me here? The butcher was closed, Ma, but I got all the... Peg. No. No, I don't want to see you. Please. Go away, Charlie. Go away. Okay. Okay. I'll go. Quinn, what time is it? About nine o'clock, Charlie. Got an hour yet for the fight. Why don't you lie down in the dressing room? That was a great stunt you pulled last night, getting cockeyed. Well, what's so wrong? It's not like he was out to win tonight. Hey, Quinn, maybe you better go out front. Yeah. Okay. Been thinking about Ben, huh? That's what's bothering you. But everybody dies, Charlie. Ben, Shorty, even you. What's the point? No point. So you're just going to box Marlowe for 15 rounds like we agreed. Nobody gets hurt, nobody gets knocked out. You'll get your money, we're squared away. The rest is conversation. Get out. Just let me alone. Let me alone. Sure. All these years, down the drain, all gone, down the drain. Introducing the worthy contender, that tough and ruddy boy from the Lone Star State, Jackie Marlowe! And now that great champion who has met and defeated all the leading contenders, the champion of the world, Charlie Davis! Your timekeeper is Bert Jackson, keeping time for the knockdowns, Tony Amada, judges Edward Watson and Paul Stoddard, referee Billy Johnson, and may the better man win. 
All right, boys, I want a good, clean, honest fight. You know what the rules are. I want you to be very careful about fouls when I tell you to break them. This is your ringside radio reporter, ladies and gentlemen, ready to bring you the first round of this long-awaited championship contest. As you know, the experts have figured Davis to beat Marlowe. They say the betting odds have been about... All right, here we go for round one. almost identical with every round as far as the progress of this fight is concerned. I can't call it a bad fight, but after 12 rounds, one thing is certain. The thousands of people who came here expecting to see a quick knockout are really disappointed. Maybe you can hear the boos. There just hasn't been any action, and the champion, Charlie Davis, looks badly out of condition. Al, Al, what round is it? It's 18 coming up. I'll fall down by the 15th. Hey, hey, the referee. I've just won, Marlow, and I'm telling you for the last time, Davis, come on and fight. Yeah, sure, sure. Hey, warn him, boys, Charlie. Okay. You happy, Quinn? Sure, I'm happy. Just three more rounds, Charlie, and you can kiss us all goodbye. Yeah, three more rounds. Story all over again. There's Davis falling into another clinch. Once again, the referee warns him to start fighting, but from the looks of things, neither man has any intention of... He's down! The champion's down! As he broke in that clinch, Marlowe Marlo suddenly lashed out with a hard right. Oh, but a hard one. The first real blow of the contest. Davis is up now. He's shaking his head, stunned. Here's Marlowe rushing him again. An uppercut. A left to the jaw. Another left. And there's a solid right to the stomach as Davis manages to hold on and clinch. Davis refuses to break. He's been hurt and he knows it. They're apart now. Marlowe's backing him against the ropes. He's got his right hand all ready now and there it goes. Davis is down again. One, two, three, four. The round's over. And Davis' seconds rush out in the ring and help the champion back to his corner. If ever a man was saved by the bell, it's Charlie Davis. Is he going to be able to come out for round 14? He's got a bad cut over the left eye and his lip is very swollen. Maybe Eddie Quinn is going to stop the fight. He's talking to Davis now. Huh? What about it, Charlie? You had enough? Shut up. Shut up and let me alone. Shut up. Take it easy, will you? You sold me out, you rat. This was a waltz. You said he knew Marlowe. You said Marlowe knew. Look, Charlie, please. You and Robert sold me out just like you sold out Ben. Look, I tell you, Marlowe just lost his head. He knows as well as you do. That... I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. Look, take a dive, Charlie. Before you get hurt. Round 14, and Marlowe rushes out ready for the kill. Already he's thrown three hard rights, but Davis appears helped for that one-minute rest. He's boxing Marlowe now, and the contender is missing badly. Davis is ripping lefts and rights into the midsection. But there's another uppercut from Marlowe, and Davis is down again. He's down on one knee. I don't think he's too badly hurt. Stand out, Charlie, stand out, take Seems nine. Seems to be take a count of nine and give his head a chance to clear. The count is seven, eight. Davis is up now, and once again, Marlowe is ramming in with a barrage of rights and lefts. He's throwing everything he's got at the chip. Charlie. Charlie, listen to me. You know what you're doing? What? What round? The last round. Coming up. Let me wait on him, Mr. Quinn. Look, get out of here. Look, Charlie, you're crazy as hell. Uh, I'm gonna kill him. Look, take a dive and finish it. Cross me up, will you? Played me for a tanker, will you? Look, you're way behind in points. You gotta knock him out to win. You know what you're doing, Charlie? I'll kill him. I'll kill him. I've never I'll seen anything him. like it before in my life. Knocked down five times by Marlowe, three times for the count of nine. Charlie Davis in round 14 suddenly became the champion he once was and all but knocked out Marlowe in the last 60 seconds. All right, there's the bell. Round 15. They come out and touch gloves. No more of this reckless throwing of leather. Each man's very cautious. And over this capacity crowd, a great silence has descended. They seem to sense the kill. There's fear in Marlowe's eyes now, and Davis stalks and weaves, looking for an opening. There goes Marlowe with his left hand, jabbing. Another jab. But Davis keeps boring and following Marlowe around the ring now like a tiger stalking his prey. And Marlowe with rights and lefts to the body. They're fighting in close now, shoulder to shoulder. Ooh, a hard right by Davis. And Marlowe is hurt. Marlowe staggered. Davis now unleashes a terrific attack. A right to the jaw, another right. Another to the head, and Marlowe is down. Marlowe is down. The count is four, five. Marlowe is motionless. He's out cold. Eight, nine, ten. The winner and steel world champion, Charlie Davis. All right, all right. Stand back, everybody. Let him through here. Let him get to his dressing room, will you? Okay, champ. This way. Charlie. Charlie, wait a minute. Get out of here, Quinn. Get out. Okay, Charlie. Sure. Okay. Uh, let him throw, folks. Let him throw. What's the matter, Eddie? Wouldn't even talk to you? It's funny how things work out, Alice. What's so funny? You're back in my league now, aren't you? Now, 
Come on, honey, let's talk it over. I guess you ducked most of the crowd, champ. You want a taxi? No, I'll find one, thanks. So long, champ. Congratulations, Charlie. Get yourself a new boy, Roberts. I've retired. What makes you think you can get away with this? What are you going to do? Kill me? Everybody dies. Charlie! Charlie, are you all right? Are you all right? Hey, I never felt better in my life. Come on, let's go home. The spotlight turns back to the stars who brought us body and soul. John Garfield, Jane Wyman, and Marie Windsor. John, I hear you're off for Broadway soon. Going back to the stage, John? Yes, Jane, a little change of pace after finishing, finishing the Roberts production of Force of Evil. And in this picture, instead of exposing the fight gamblers, John gets after the numbers racket. With the help of Marie Windsor, how can I miss? Seriously, though, I hope the picture can show people... How vicious the numbers game is. Sounds exciting, John. But one of the most exciting offerings I've seen on the screen recently is Jane Wyman's performance in the Warner Brothers picture, Johnny Belinda. Well, thank you, Bill. Everyone's been very kind. I understand you took up a new hobby while you were out on location for the picture, Jane. I began painting in oils, Bill. <laughs> sold a picture yet? Yes, I sold my first effort to a rather naive art collector for $4.75. 400, <laughs> 475 bucks. How would you like to be my agent? Well, not exactly. It was $4.75. <laughs> See, $4 for the paint and 75 cents for the canvas. Oh, what subject are you working on now? <laughs> Me. <laughs> a self-portrait. Well, that's nice work if you can get it. Well, all day long I look in the mirror, then I run quick for the easel before I forget how I look. <laughs> well, that painting should immortalize a famous Lux complexion. Thank you, Bill. You know I've always used Lux soap. It's really grand as a complexion care. What about next week, Bill? Next Monday's play is a recent Paramount success, The Big Clock. And we'll have the original stars of the picture, Ray Milland and Marino Sullivan. It's a story with a novel twist that holds the audience in suspense until the last scene. Perfect for radio drama. That sounds like good listening, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. That applause says it all. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen... Uh, the people of this nation have recently demonstrated to the world their freedom to choose a government. But our American system means more than just the right to vote. It also means that we live better than people elsewhere in the world. And we do that by producing more. We produce more per man, per machine, per hour, and this wealth of production goes hand in hand with our basic freedom. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Ray Milland and Maureen O'Sullivan in The Big Clock. This is William Keeley saying goodnight to you from Hollywood. Third in our cast tonight were Bill Conrad as Quinn and Wilms Herbert, Janet Scott, Douglas Evans, James Edwards, Carlton Cadell, Jeff Chandler, Bill Johnstone, Herbert Butterfield, Leo Cleary, Maura Martin, Eddie Marr, and Howard McNear. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Ray Milland and Maureen O'Sullivan in The Big Clock. Reliance Pride! S-P-R-Y. For lighter, finer, richer tasting cakes, Spry tops any other type shortening. Spry's amazing cake improver takes guesswork and hard work out of cake making. Try Spry's one bowl method for glorious cakes. For all you bake and fry, rely on Spry. S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of The Big Clock, starring Ray Milland and Maureen O'Sullivan. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>